In this week's Carry Wrap, we'll take a look at some of the top carry news from the past week, as well as speak with Freedom Pop about its funding field expansion. Well, thanks for joining us on This Week Carry Wrap. I'm your host, Dan Meyer, Editor-in-Chief here at RCR Wireless News. This week, we have a featured interview with Stephen Stokels, who's the CEO and co-founder of MVNO Freedom Pop, to get some insight into its operations and recent expansion. But first, let's take a look at some of the top carrier news from the past week. The FCC this week leveled a nearly $1.4 million fine against Verizon Wireless, connected to the carrier's since discontinued insertion of so-called super cookies into its customers' mobile internet traffic without their knowledge or consent. The undeletable identifiers were inserted into web traffic and used to identify customers in order, to, in order to deliver targeted ads from Verizon and other third parties. Verizon Wireless announced last year that it would allow customers to disable the targeted advertising program following the launch of a federal probe into the initiative. Also this week, T-Mobile US garnered another $2 billion in financing ahead of its planned partic participation in the upcoming 600 megahertz incentive auction scheduled to start later this month. T-Mobile parent company Deutsche Telekom said it would offer the additional funds as part of a purchase of T-Mobile senior notes. T-Mobile has over the past several months been, acc been accruing funds geared towards the particip participation in the Spectrum auction. Analysts have forecast T-Mobile could spend up to $10 billion on Spectrum licenses in the auction proceedings with CEO John Legere previously stating the carrier would be aggressive in the auction. That aggressiveness will be enhanced by T-Mobile's ability to bid on the so-called reserve spectrum that the FCC placed outside the reach of industry heavyweights Verizon and AT&T. DT last week said it planned to not pursue a sale of its 75% stake in T-Mobile US during the Spectrum auction, which is expected to last into the, into the later part of this year. Finally, Rootmetrics this week released a market-by-market -market comparison of cellular network performance, taking measurements from the company's testing during the second half of last year. Atlanta topped the list in overall available cellular, cellular performance, followed by Chicago, Indianapolis, Sacramento, and Rockford, Illinois. Atlanta and Chicago also topped the list from testing conducted during the first half of last year. The five worst performing markets were, were, were perennial last place finisher Hudson Valley, New York, Omaha, Nebraska, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Santa Rosa, California, and Denver. For our featured interview this week, we spoke with Steven Stokels, who's the CEO and co-founder of mobile virtual network operator Freedom Pop. The MVNO, which domestically runs on cellular service provided by Sprint, has over the past year snared tens of millions of dollars in VC funding that has been used to fuel extensive domestic and international expansion plans. The cash infusion has also allowed the company to remain an independent entity following rumors last year of a potential acquisition. Stokos provided an insight into the company's business model, its ability to compete in the incredibly competitive market, and plans for the future. Let's take a look at the interview now. All right, well, thanks for joining us this week. Uh, this week, we're joined by uh, Stephen Stokels, who's the uh, CEO and co-founder of uh, Freedom Pop. Hey, Stephen, thanks for joining us this week. We appreciate it. Yeah, glad to be here. Great. Let me just start off with uh, those. I'm sure people have heard the name, uh, know a lot about Freedom Pop, but maybe get some insights and some, some background from you on maybe what the company is and kind of what you guys do out there on the market. Yeah, I mean, in short, Freedom Pop delivers free mobile service. Uh, and so we've taken a very internet-centric, uh, not only technology approach, but business model approach to the mobile space. We have a freemium service. In the U.S., it's uh, 500 megs, 200 text, 200 voice. In the UK, it's 200, 200, 200. Uh, we're expanding globally. Uh, and we enable that whole freemium model via a very unique uh, approach uh, to the mobile space and specific uh, proprietary technology and capabilities. Very good. Well, maybe start off, I know people always kind of ask me whenever I'm talking about Freedom Pop is, you know, the business model aspect of what you guys do out there. Because again, uh, offering free service seems like a very tricky way to run a business. But uh, uh, how do you guys, how do you guys, I guess, uh, keep, the, uh, keep the lights on there? Yeah, that's a good question because really what people don't realize is, is it really is a unique business model in the sense that we're not actually, unlike pretty much any other MVNO or even carrier, we're not trying to make money on voice, text, or data. A matter of fact, if we're even losing a little bit of money on data, we're okay with that. <laughs> uh, what we're trying to do is actually offer additional value-added services, whether it be a second number. Uh, for example, one of our more popular services right now uh, is people in the U.S. buying numbers from Mexico, so low, you know, friends and family can, can call for free from back there, or in the U.K. buying numbers from Eastern European countries. So virtual numbers, uh, paying a couple bucks a month to roll over unused data, uh, online security, et cetera. So we sell a suite of these internet value-added services, uh, and we have about 15 of them live, and those are all margin for us. So what we ultimately are trying to do is add value to the mobile experience, make our money that way, and then be able to subsidize more and more uh, data at either free or wholesale costs. Got it. So I, I guess, 
Yeah, I'm guessing this model then is a pretty uh, low margin model, I'm guessing for, for the most part as well. Uh, so that's, that's the key. The, the margins on data are extremely low because we're basically passing wholesale rates to the end consumer. But because the margins on these value added services are 80%, 90%, the overall margins we have in the business are somewhere between 45 and 55%. Very nice. And then I guess, how do you, how, I guess, how do you differentiate, differentiate yourself in the marketplace? Obviously, it seems like the MVNO models uh, here in the U.S. have been on a bit of a roller coaster over the past 10, 15 years. Uh, it seems like recently a lot more have been coming out. But, but I guess, how do you guys make yourselves uh, you know, a little different from, from the competition out there? Yeah, that's easy. Free. Okay. I mean, at the end of the day, <laughs> free service. And the beauty is, like, because we have a different business model, and it's truly a unique model that relies on actually selling uh, value-added services and digital services, uh, we ultimately can go free and we ultimately can compete on price uh, even with the carriers who have the network uh, ownership economics because we're making our money and our margins a different way. Got it. And you guys aren't more like, you don't rely a lot on Wi-Fi. I mean, obviously Wi-Fi is a component of all of this, but you guys aren't, I know a lot of them out there the in maybe knows kind of are very reliant on Wi-Fi uh, connectivity. You guys are, are kind of a little bit different that way and, yet, and that you don't rely exclusively or even heavily on, on Wi-Fi connections. Yeah, I mean, we embrace Wi-Fi because Wi-Fi delivers more value to the consumer uh, and we do VoIP over Wi-Fi, et cetera. But at the end of the day, unlike some of the other guys out there, we're not relying on Wi-Fi for a model to work. Matter of fact, it, you could say the opposite. We actually rely on strong data partners, uh, network partners, to make our model work because ultimately, you know, we're going VoIP over LTE as well and we're actually trying to make some money on, on data upsells. Uh, so we embrace Wi-Fi because it's obviously a way to deliver more value to the end user, but ultimately we're not a Wi-Fi first dependency. Uh, and it's truly, uh, again, unique to some of the other guys out there trying to embrace Wi-Fi to deliver value. Got it, got it. And obviously, the business model seems to work. I know uh, you guys have been uh, on a kind of a roll recently on getting some, uh, some funding. I know there was some talk last year about a potential sale or something like that, but it seems like you guys kind of got the, the funding route. Can you talk a bit about, I guess, the, the attraction that, that, these fund, that these VCs are seeing to you guys and, and the importance of getting that funding to kind of really support your, your, what's been a, bit, a pretty big expansion for you guys, too? Yeah, absolutely. And so first off, we're gl glad we didn't sell uh, about 12, 15 months ago because uh, we've actually doubled or tri tripled the valuations from what we were looking to sell at a, you know, a year and a half ago, a year ago. Um, and we've kind of raised two rounds. We raised a round earlier, uh, you know, mid-2015, and then at the beginning of this year, we closed a much bigger round. Uh, and as far as specifically answering what VCs or what investors like about the business, it's really two things. It's one is we've proven out this new model. Uh, and when you dig under the cover, uh, like these guys do in diligence, you see the model isn't sort of uh, easy to replicate. There's been some guys who try to copy, but they can't uh, end up getting the conversions we get into our, our value-added services that make the model hum. Uh, and then two, international expansion. Because we're internet-centric, because we leverage OTT technologies for the voice and text, uh, and we're not device-centric like some of the MVNOs who were alluded to earlier, uh, we can expand internationally with very little friction. Uh, opening up the UK, uh, was a 90-day effort for us. We'll be opening up uh, additional international markets uh, in the next three to six months. And we also have a lot of carrier partners who are coming to us and saying, look, rather than a typical wholesale arrangement, why don't we partner, form a JV or some sort of entity that we can actually collaborate and disrupt the market together because they appreciate and understand the capability we have to deliver this sort of disruptive uh, value to the consumer. Yeah, it's been an interesting part of what you've been able to do because, I mean, you know, maybe from, you know, looking at it from the outside, you guys don't seem like you're, you're, you're too large, but this international expansion has been uh, pretty impressive. I mean, a lot of companies here domestically who have started as MBNOs, you know, they just struggle just to kind of keep the lights on. Uh, but, you know, you guys have been able to really uh, grow internationally. I guess what's been, I guess, the impetus behind that and what's been, you know, I guess the reception you've seen internationally to what you guys are offering in the market. Yeah, and so again, unlike your traditional MVNO, you know, uh, we're not a marketing-centric company. We're, we're not, uh, you know, our business isn't predicated on a marketing or a brand, ESPN or, or Virgin <laughs> brand or whatever it may be, and it's not predicated on some unique distribution local to the country or a niche, like going after, you know, Latin Americans with two kids who <laughs> come from Mexico in the last two weeks but don't have, uh, you know, a T-Mobile phone or whatever it might be. And so so it's, a, it's a mass appeal, but more importantly, we, we built this thing out to scale globally. And so like I said, when you look at it, um, we're software centric, our apps, our, our, our actual infrastructure set up, you can plug in any network. I mean, right now we actually have 25 networks uh, across the globe uh, where our roaming sims work. And it's very easy for us, you know, in a matter of three to three, well, less than that, probably two to three months, we can plug in a new network and it just runs on our infrastructure. So it allows us to expand globally very quickly. Uh, and then again, our value and our ability to offer free that transcends all cultures. I mean, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what country you're in, if you can deliver value and you can deliver a free service, people flock to it. And we're seeing that in the UK, which has been live for four months and is exploding. 
Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. I mean, I know this international expansion is still somewhat new for you guys, but what's been the reception so far? Because it does seem like in a lot of those markets, the MVNO space has been pretty well supported for, for quite some time. It hasn't seemed to really have the roller coaster we've had in the U.S. What's been the reception to you guys internationally there? Yeah, so actually it's a good point because in markets like the U.K., it's a more mature uh, MVNO market. Yeah. MVNOs as a group have much bigger market share in, in the U.K. and other European countries, which is a positive for us. Um, but coming into the market, I mean, we've been live for four months and the big question was, okay, I'm sure there'll be demand for your free service. That's compelling. <laughs> you make the model work. It's a different market. We had a lot of uh, UK journalists saying, hey, Brits are very frugal, <laughs> not like Americans. And I, you know, and so there were, there were some uh, doubts uh, around whether or not the model could actually move into a, a more, at least an admittedly more frugal market. And the reality is I think four months in, we've kind of proven it does. We have different sets of services. So in the UK, for example, uh, Online security and virtual numbers are much bigger sellers than they are in the U.S. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're up to 44% now of our users in the U.K. who are converting into a some sort of paid service. Uh, and to benchmark that you know, against the U.S., we're at about 50%. So within four months, we're very close. And it took us 12 months to go from 5% to 50% uh, in the U.S. In the U.K., it's taken us three months to go from 20% all the way up to 44%. Got it. And you, I just mentioned earlier, too, you guys are looking for some uh, further international expansion coming out in the next few months. Is that kind of the, the plan for now? Yeah, so we're already integrated into a bunch of uh, international networks. We'll start to launch commercial markets uh, uh, in, in other uh, regions ac across Europe. Uh, and then more interestingly, like I said, you'll see some joint ventures uh, where we're working either with uh, cable companies, actually, or carriers direct to launch uh, joint ventures where we sort of collaborate to disrupt. And, and that allows us to move much quicker because we can go into a market where a local a, a large local company has infrastructure, distribution, some, some money to put behind it, and really start to get uh, more aggressive uh, in the international play by these partnerships. Yeah, I was going to ask you a bit about that because it, it makes a good point because you guys, your platform does seem to kind of not just, not really be, you know, necessarily wireless carrier specific or centric. It is something that seems like, you know, if a company, a cable company, for instance, wants to get into the space, uh, it seems like a pretty good model to kind of partner with you guys and at least use your platform uh, to get in there. Are you seeing a lot of, I guess, uh, acceptance or at least uh, interest from, non-traditional uh, telecom guys out there? Yeah, because we are. And the reason is if you look at a cable company, um, they have assets, they have distribution, in some cases they have Wi-Fi networks where they, and they want to get into the mobile space. Um, but the reality is, as you alluded to before, MVNOs uh, across the world fail at very high rates. And to get, to get real volume uh, in this space, you got to do something different. And you got to do something a little more. If you come in with a, a price plan that's 15% less than the market, e.g. Google, um, you're not going to get to millions of subs. Uh, and even Google, a company of their stature and credibility, is struggling in the uh, Google Fi project just because of the fact that it's not really unprecedented value being delivered to the user. It's cool technology. Uh, and their object objectives may be different. But if you're a cable company trying to come in, you've got to do something different. And like I said before, cable companies that we're talking to are starting to realize, okay, Freedom Pop does bring some unique capabilities and some expertise on delivering this sort of new model. And to the extent we do partner with them, we can potentially – accelerate our own disruption. So, so it's a very, uh, I would say we're getting a lot of interest uh, and a lot of it's actually inbound as well uh, as we start to sort of grow. Got it. And I guess maybe competing on, on your own brand name, I mean, how are you able to, I guess, compete out there? Because it does seem like, like you said earlier, you know, you guys aren't a big brand name, you're not a Disney, an ESPN, a Virgin. Uh, but when you go into a market, for the most part, you guys are going under your own brand. Uh, how are you able to, I guess, find a, a niche out there, which without the huge advertising budgets, I mean, obviously the telecom space, wireless in particular, uh, you can't get away, you can't go you know watch any TV show without seeing twenty uh, uh, wireless commercials on there. Uh, how do you uh, I guess differentiate yourself from a branding perspective in, in the market out there? Yeah, that's a good question because because that's actually a challenge. I mean, obviously, what we're doing is we're trying to I mean we're delivering a uh, unprecedented value to the consumer. Sure. So that in and of itself has a sort of uh, echo effect sure. uh, and drives a lot of organic and viral traction. But on top of that, really uh, from a branding perspective, when we go into a new market and nobody's heard of Freedom Pop, and so in some cases. Uh, echoes from the U.S. are actually uh, reverberate into markets like in the U.K. But in other cases, we actually may not be as uh, religious with the brand. So if we're going in with a partner to say into, I'm a hypothetical, let's say we're going into, I'm trying to pick a market we're actually not going into. <laughs> let's say we're going into Japan, for example, with a partner. Um, okay. We might not be beholden to using the Freedom Pop brand if that partner has a brand that may have, uh, that may resonate more and have more brand value behind it. Um, so it, it's a good question. Uh, we're trying to build a brand, obviously. Uh, we'd like to have Freedom Pop as a, as a global brand, but at the same time, we're not religiously holding to it where there's better options. Yeah, you guys are pretty easy going about the whole thing. and Not, 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 too, uh, not too much of a big deal for you guys. Yeah, well, well put. Yeah. <laughs>
Uh, well, I guess maybe looking at the, I guess at the market in general here in the U.S. specifically, um, you know, I, I think you've got quite a bit of history, obviously, in the MVNO space. And we've talked about it already, the fact that MVNOs have kind of come, kind of come and gone in, in the market. You know, as you look at the market overall, I mean, what's, what's the, the big challenge for MVNOs? Because it does seem like whenever one launches, you know, the big guys tend to kind of, you know, if they, if they see some threat there, they will, uh, you know, kind of go after that threat pretty aggressively. You know, how have you guys been able to kind of stay perhaps below the radar a bit, but still make, make a name for yourself in a market that seems to really uh, be a, a bit of a challenge for, uh, for the MVNOs, MVNOs out there? Yeah, it's a great question because I'll be honest with you. If you're an MVNO, uh, a matter of fact, I have a lot of uh, people coming up to me people trying to start an MVNO. What do you think of this idea? And I actually say, you're crazy. <laughs> um, because the MVNO space is extremely under attack right now, globally. Uh, but if, you know, take the US, for example. Uh, marketing spend is up. So net ads across the entire industry are down to flat and they're actually projected to go down further over the next year or two. Yep. At the same time, you've got marketing spend that's increasing uh, and rivalry that's increasing. Uh, and MVNOs are getting squeezed. Uh, MVNOs are hurting across the space. I mean, if you look across the hundreds of MVNOs in the US, there's a, a very small handful, sub 10 that have any scale. Um, so I think broadly speaking, it's not a good space. Now, like I said before, Freedom Pop has managed to buck that trend, but partially because we actually are playing a different game. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it's a different business model. We're able to offer uh, value well beyond uh, what a carrier can do because we're generating these margins uh, from the, the different revenue sources. So by playing a different game, we've been able to sort of, uh, say, avoid a lot of the downfalls of MVNOs. But a traditional MVNO coming in right now, there really is no room for it. And, and I, think a chat, I think you'll see consolidation uh, in the MVNO space as some of the small guys continue to struggle on either fire sale or, or, or sell uh, into bigger guys at, at some you know, decent valuation. So, Broadly speaking, and in the U.S. specifically, uh, I think MVNOs are under attack. And in markets like Europe that you alluded to, it's more mature. Yeah. Uh, MVNOs are more entrenched, and there's some bigger players who can compete more effectively. But, but really, at the end of the day, Freedom Pop plays a different game, and that's what allows us to really sort of avoid a lot of the perils that's going on in the industry right now. And, and obviously, like you kind of said earlier, it, sem it sounds like you guys are in this for the uh, at least longer, short, midterm at this point. I mean, you're not looking at uh, any sort of deals. Uh, again, the, the VC funding seems to have kind of been able to really stabilize your operations for, for the most part. Yeah, the kind of deals we're looking for now are partnerships. Okay. So some of the guys who were looking to buy us before we're now actually partnering with. So they can get some of the assets they were looking to buy, our capabilities, but it's via a partnership at this point. Very good. Makes sense. All right. Well, I guess maybe looking forward to the next six to 12 months. I mean, obviously, you guys are going to be the market there for a while. I mean, what's your kind of view of the, I guess, maybe of what you guys plan to do over the next six to 12 months? And then what's your maybe general view of, I guess, the, um, maybe not, I guess, the wireless market, but I guess the MPNOs, how they compete in the wireless market uh, here domestically and also maybe, in, maybe internationally too. Yeah, so I think if you look over the next uh, 12 months, right, from our perspective, there's really three things we're going to be doing. One, we're going to continue to grow in the U.S., uh, likely add a second carrier uh, to the U.S. as well okay. uh, and accelerate the growth there. Uh, we've worked out a lot of product kinks, a lot of technology kinks, and so we're really uh, looking to accelerate our distribution. Uh, two, we're gonna, you, you'll see broader international growth, and, and that's going to come on or get, you know, launches like we've done in the UK and in other markets where we kind of go in organically and you're going to see some joint ventures announced uh, and those will be in collaboration with, with notable big companies. Um, and so by the end of this year, if you look fast forward 12 months, I think we'll, we'll be at least two, two times bigger in the US, hopefully three times bigger. Uh, but more importantly, you'll, you'll probably see us in at least four or five different markets uh, and hopefully more. But, but like I said, at least four or five by the end of the year with the path to be able to double or triple that up in 2017. Very interesting. Very good. Well, hey, Stephen, we definitely appreciate this. It's always good to catch up with you guys. Again, you guys have been uh, very uh, explosive in your growth over, over the recent, you know, that past six to 12 months. And obviously the VC funding has been great too for you guys. But uh, it's always great to catch up with you on that. We definitely appreciate the time and insight today. Yeah, I appreciate having me. All Enjoyed right. It. All right. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Well, thanks for watching this week's Carry Wrap. And make sure to check us out again next week.